I guess my primary interest in the Walls of the Roses. We might just have to go back. Okay. What, do you want me to start again? No, bear with me on this one. Okay. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for waiting. I think uh, we had a little bit of a technical issue there. Um, thank you very much. Welcome to Swiping Through History. This is our first ever live stream debate. Um, and wow, what a way to start. I'm so honored to have here this evening, not one, not two, but four leading historians, um, all who specialize in the Wars of the Roses and are ready to discuss and debate some of the most controversial questions surrounding the period. So uh, first of all, I would love to introduce everybody. Uh, so we have in the white corner representing the House of York, Mike Ingram. Mike, please may you introduce yourself and say a little bit about one of the works that you have written on the period. Good evening. Um, Mike Ingram, medieval historian. I have a deep interest in all medieval periods, um, particularly the Wars of the Roses. Um, my new book, or my latest book on, on from the Wars of the Roses, is this one, which is Richard III and the Battle of Bosworth, which looks at the the whole of Richard's reign and Henry's and puts the two of them side by side, and how they finally come together at Bosworth. It also looks at it very much from a European point of view, uh, and includes uh, how, particularly how how the French were very much involved in Richard's defeat at Bosworth. Um, and there will be a new book coming out later on in the year, which looks at the beginnings of the Wars of the Roses. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Mike. Uh, everybody at home, the links to these books will be in the description of the video. So if you do listen to, to what these guys say and you like what you hear and you want to find out more, please do go and check out these links, check out their works. They are all fantastic. But standing shoulder to shoulder with Mike for our debate this evening, we also have the wonderful Matt Lewis. Matt, the stage is yours. Thank you, Tom. Uh, delighted to be here taking to the, the battle of the field of battle with Mike. Um, I am a writer. I've written several books about the Wars of the Roses. My main area of interest is probably Richard III uh, and the Princes in the Tower as well, I guess. You know, sticky subject to maybe get onto later. Um, <laughs> but I've also written a biography of Richard, Duke of York, um, the father of Edward IV and Richard III, which really gave me a, a, an interest and a fascination with the earlier period of the Wars of the Roses. Uh, and he's a, a fascinating figure who was a key player in that. Uh, the book I have on screen there is my uh, full-length biography of Richard III, entitled Richard III, Loyalty Binds Me, which is really a cradle-to-grave look at Richard III's life and a, an attempt to examination, examine how the first 30 years of his life really impacted his brief reign as king and what kind of man we can tell him to have been. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure we're going to have a few questions to ask you about that a little bit later on. So moving on to the red corner and to the House of Lancaster, we have the awesome Nicola Natalis. Please say a few words, Nicola. Thank you for having for being here with us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's wonderful to be here with you all this evening and speaking alongside my fellow historians. I am the medieval newbie, if you like, because I'm primarily a Tudor historian um, but I completed my doctorate on the subject of the jewellery collections of the Yorkist and early Tudor queens. Um, and I'm also recently a podcaster. I have got my own podcast named History Gems. And I'm also the author of three books. But the one that's most relevant for this evening's is my biography of Margaret Beaufort, Uncrowned Queen. Um, so that was my kind of way into the Wars of the Roses, if you like. And I'm hoping to fascinate you with Margaret's story this evening. Oh, fantastic. Well, we look forward to hearing all about Margaret a little bit later on. Standing shoulder to shoulder with you, Nicola, we also have the one, the only, Nathan Amen. Welcome to the team, Nathan. Thank you for being here. Please say a few words. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm an author from West Wales who's primarily, who primarily focuses on the life, times and background of Henry VII. I suppose you could say I'm that Henry VII guy, if you will. Um, I wrote my first book in 2017 on the Beaufort family, Henry's forebears. 
um, which I think was a, a decent introduction into the most captivating family there was during the Wars of the Roses. Sorry, the Yorks. Um, and my upcoming book is Henry the Seventh and the Two the Pretenders, which is going to look at the innumerable plots and conspiracies that Henry the Seventh had to face once he became King of England. It wasn't an easy ride once he won at Bosworth. <laughs> Well, fantastic. We look forward to asking some more questions about that a little bit later on. Um, so uh, obviously tonight it is a debate. So we do have a poll for you guys in the audience to have your say and choose the house that you will support. And it is these guys' jobs to convince you to their cause. I'm sure some of you might already have a side that you are very much affiliated with, but please do heed these guys' words carefully. Who knows, they might manage to change your opinion. The link to the poll is in the description of the video and I will keep posting it in the chat throughout the stream as well. Um, so uh, at the end of the, 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 the debate, we will also have a 20 minute uh, period where we can answer some of your questions. So if throughout this discussion, there are, there's anything that really jumps to mind that you want to ask these guys, please note it in the chat stating your name, who the question is for and the question. And as we go through, I'll make a note of a few of them and then pose them to these guys at the very end. But let's now get started. So a little bit of background, the Wars of the Roses was a, in a way, a series of rebellions that took place from roughly 1455 to 1487. Now, during that time, it saw the houses of York and Lancaster uh, fight against each other for control, influence, power, and most importantly of all, the throne of England itself. The period saw five kings, seven reigns, 10 coups d'etats, uh, 15 invasions, and 16 major battles. Which leads me on to my first question of this evening, which I think is a great place to start. And Matt, I'd love it to, to, to aim this one at you to start with. Um, were the Wars of the Roses inevitable? It's a difficult question. I think hindsight is always going to tell us that the Wars of the Roses were inevitable if we look at the calamities that went on throughout the 15th century. But that's, that's not the case for those people who were living through those early years in the 1440s and the 1450s, and they were watching this descent towards civil war. I think you would always feel like it wasn't inevitable. There were, I think there were innumerable opportunities for either side to have stopped what was happening or to have backed out from what was happening. And I think that goes back as early as 1447, for example, is one of the dates I often throw in as a potential beginning for the Wars of the Roses. So Henry VI um, allows his uncle, his last uncle, Humphrey Duke of Gloucester to be arrested and Humphrey dies in custody amid all kinds of rumours that he was poisoned or suffocated, although the official story is that he had a stroke from the shock. And this was because Henry believed his uncle was potentially after his throne. So you have a sense of paranoia there from Henry VI and around his court. He doesn't have an heir at this point, so he's obviously worried about who might follow him. And I think all of this escalates from then on. So after Humphrey Duke of Gloucester is killed, Opposition to the House of Lancaster for the first time kind of moves outside the House of Lancaster. Humphrey was a, a vessel for opposition to the, the court policy. Henry VI wanted peace with France. Humphrey was the man who was saying, nah, let's fight the French, let's keep going, let's keep beating them up. And that was incredibly popular in the country. That was a message that people wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. And while that was being voiced by Humphrey, who was loyal to his nephew, there wasn't too much danger. But his death kind of drives that opposition to look for a new head, and that ends up with Richard, Duke of York, kind of inheriting that. And I think then as you move through the decade, you have all of these opportunities. So Richard, Duke of York comes back to England in 1450 after Cage Rebellion. Some would say to try and seize power. I think he's, at this point he's genuinely trying to help re, you know, regain control of government. Um, but by 1452, he's taking an army to Dartford to kind of impose himself on Henry VI. And Henry VI has him arrested and, and makes him swear an oath of fealty, but you kind of feel like if he'd been a bit harsher and he'd executed Richard, Duke of York at that point for treason, potentially that's the end of the trouble. Um, Henry's illness sees York thrown into a protectorate in charge of the government. 
He struggles to bring everybody with him, although he tries to be quite inclusive. But as soon as Henry recovers, he ejects York from office and sends him back into the political wilderness. And we have these wonderful quotes about, you know, if Henry's illness was a, a, a tragedy, then his recovery was a disaster. Um, and all of these parties are being kind of driven further and further apart by the, the paranoia, the fear of each other, the failure to conclusively deal with all of these issues that are springing up, which I think is a character weakness of, of Henry, really. Mm. It's his job at the top of the tree to really impose himself on these people. When do, so you again, think the, um, when, when do you think the two houses really start to kind of materialise into York and Lancaster? Um, when does that really start to, to, to come to fruition? Again, it's difficult to to define. I mean, you don't get the House of York claiming the throne of the House of Lancaster until 1460, really late on in 1460, after almost a decade. You know, we've had battles during this period mm -hmm. um, where they're professing loyalty to Henry still. It's about all of the government rather than who, sh who has the right to sit on the throne. Um, so I think the, the houses emerge and sort of polarise throughout the 1450s in a really gradual way. There, it's difficult to pinpoint a moment where suddenly there are enemies and it's York versus Lancaster. It's all a lot more complicated than that with everybody picking sides along the way and moving from side to side, depending on what suits them best. So I think it's really difficult to pin down a moment. I think there were lots of opportunities to stop the Wars of the Roses, and it probably doesn't become inevitable until as late as 1460, really. But it's all of those failures to deal with the problems that lead to the real trouble and, and make it inevitable. Mm. Um, so, so Mike, then, so obviously uh, uh, Matt's given us a really good kind of uh, uh, look into whether it was inevitable or not. Um, when do you believe the, the Wars of the Roses would have, you can kind of say, officially started? Because I guess that is a big question up to date among many historians as well, is actually putting, in a way, a date or a time period of, of when it officially begins. I think that's a really tricky question. But if you go back even further to the early reign of um, Henry IV, we see a, a, a whole series of Yorkist risings then. Um, they don't actually come to anything, um, mainly because Henry stops them before they get very far. But I always, I always say that that potentially could be, because it is still York against Lancaster, these, these early risings, we have the second Duke of York very much involved in it all the time. So I think there's a whole series there. And if any of those had actually succeeded, we would have been very different from, from that point onwards. So for, from the early 1400s. Um, I would then add to that um, Jack Cage Rebellion, which Matt has already mentioned. Um, I believe that there was two sides to, um, to Cage Rebellion. Um, the first side, uh, I do think the Duke of York was very much involved in it. Um, and I think a couple of his lieutenants were very much there. The, the, the very early stages of, of Cage Rebellion um, is very, very military, very well organised and very planned. Um, it's only after that initial army disperses do we get the Jack Cade that we all know and hate, uh, for want of a better description. And and uh, he, the, the guy who, who reappears is just a rebel and causes all the trouble. So, again, I think it splits into two. Um, and then again, again, as Matt's already said, the Dartford Rebellion, if that had succeeded, everything would be different after that as well. So I think there are a few key points where there are potentially history-changing events that, that, that don't happen uh, for whatever reason. And then obviously we come on to, to the later stages. I feel like uh, with, with one of the most amazing things about the Wars of the Roses as a period are all of these personalities that are kind of competing for power and, and in this kind of political game. Um, so, Nathan, obviously, uh, the, the, the Tudors, the, the, Tudor, the Tudor family, um, at the beginning of the Wars, of, we hear a lot about them at the end of the Wars of the Roses, obviously, they, they're in their, in their kind of rise to power. But what's kind of happening for them under, you know, uh, it, uh, in, in the background, as it were, at the beginning of this kind of period. And, and also, well, I want to ask you a little bit about your opinion on, on Richard, Duke of York, because uh, Matt has said uh, a lot about how uh, he doesn't believe he, his, in, his intention was to immediately kind of 
claim the throne, as it were. He did genuinely want to help. What, what are your thoughts and, and, and feelings on that? I mean, first things first, if we take the Wars of the Roses as beginning in the 1450s, uh, the first battle is 1455. I personally ascribe to the belief that the Wars of the Roses began in 1450 and that the Wars of the Roses were at heart a rivalry between the houses of Beaufort and the House of York. Um, so 1450, let's take that as the start date of the Wars of the Roses. Henry Tudor, the ultimate victor of the Wars of the Roses, if we want to call him that, was a Beaufort by blood. He was born in 1457. So he was born right at the start of this period. And you could argue, as somebody born into the House of Lancaster, this was certainly a precarious time for a child to be born. Uh, his father was Edmund Tudor. He was a man of Welsh and French descent, and he was the Earl of Richmond. Now, Edmund Tudor was also the younger half-brother of King Henry VI, the king of the House of Lancaster. So we have Henry Tudor being born in West Wales right to the start of the Wars of the Roses, and he was a nephew of Henry VI, you know, real close to the House of Lancaster. Furthermore, his mother was Margaret Beaufort. Now, Margaret Beaufort was part of the House of Lancaster. Um, the Beaufort relations were the closest faction to the Lancastrians. So Henry Tudor is a child born really deep into the Lancastrian side. Now, obviously, the war is playing out in England um, quite heavily at this time, and the Yorkists are starting um, to rise to power. In 1461, when Henry Tudor was just four years old, the Yorkists claimed the throne. They won the throne. They became the kings. So you have a four-year-old boy of Lancastrian bearing um, who could be presumed by some to eventually grow into a great Lancastrian magnet. Uh, he certainly would not have been considered a, a, you know, material for the kingship. I mean, Henry Tudor was a noble of Lancastrian blood, but he was so far removed from the throne, nobody was looking at him as a potential Lancastrian claimant when he was a child. But he was still considered a Lancastrian noble, and he was handed over into control of the Herbert family of Raglan. Now, the Herberts were a were another great Welsh dynasty who were ardent supporters of the House of York. In England, if we have the House of York versus the House of Lancaster, we have something similar happening in Wales on a much smaller scale between the House of Tudor and the House of Herbert. They are the two driving forces in Wales. One Lancastrian aligned, one Yorkist aligned. So Henry Tudor, four years old, is handed over to the enemies of his family to be raised. And he was raised with the Herberts for the next 10 years. So the answer about what's happening with the Tudors is not much during this period. You know, they are still um, a relatively minor family, closely aligned to the Lancastrian throne, but not in the line of succession. Um, they are identified as a family of potential, which is why Jasper Tudor was so, uh, Jasper Tudor being Henry Tudor's other uncle, was being targeted quite hard by the Yorkists during this period. But I think what, obviously we have hindsight that, that we know as historians, but I think this period is really the making of Henry Tudor. It's the period where he is being raised as a child without any power, being raised by um, a family who are enemies to his family, and yet he doesn't hate them. He doesn't grow to hate the Herberts. He grows to respect the Herberts. He has a good upbringing with the Herberts. I think these seeds are being, um, you know, almost germinated in his mind as a child, that there is peace to be had if you could just bring together these rival families who perhaps have more in common than they have that divides them. So just to finish the question, not much is happening with the Tudors, but I think the seeds are being set for the future. Yeah, Nicola. Just wanted to add something to what um, Nate just said there, which was um, there is this really common misconception with Margaret Beaufort that she, which has been 
uh, popularized, I think, through through um, through popular culture, particularly in recent years. That you know, from the moment of her son's birth, she was gunning for him to become king, and she had her eyes very firmly set on that throne. And you know, as Nathan's already said, there wasn't really anything going on with the Tudors at this point. And nobody would have considered Henry Tudor as a candidate for the throne at this point. That comes much, much later. And there's no evidence whatsoever to suggest, you know, that Margaret was really pushing her son forward as a potential claimant. Because, in fact, you know, as the, as the turbulence of the 1450s and, and 1460s plays out, and 1470s actually, it's very clear that Margaret's priority was on ensuring her son's well-being and his safety. Um, you know, it, it'd been very difficult. Uh, we'll talk about Margaret, of course, but I just wanted to say, yeah, that there's, <laughs> it's just nonsense that, that, you know, that Henry Tudor was born and she was working on propelling him towards the throne because in the whole grand scheme of 15th century England, the arrival of Henry Tudor in the world didn't matter to anyone apart from Margaret Beaufort. Mm. Matt, uh, let, let's, uh, let's hear from, from you. I only really want to add to that, that even as a Ricardian who is obviously on the Yorkist side, I completely totally agree with that. This whole idea that Margaret Beaufort had some prophetic vision of her son in the cradle one day becoming king is born from historical fiction and needs to disappear from discussion it just isn't yeah. an issue at all I think it's something that both sides can agree on this yeah. is just something that's appeared been fabricated sort of seeped its way into the collective consciousness and now everybody quotes it as reality um and I think as a Ricardian who complains about people who do that to Richard III with Shakespeare and stuff like that we have to recognize these things and just knock them out of the park you know it's just not true it's just not the case can i ask what that uh, historical fiction is that you're you're referencing to that 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 has kind of started this kind of uh feeling towards <laughs> margaret is that is that a bus coming that you're just going to throw me under no um <laughs> it's it's philippa gregory's white queen you know this is the the main vehicle that had margaret Beaufort as this passionately obsessive devout woman who had this idea that from the date that her son was born, he was going to be king one day and she ploughed all of her efforts into making that happen. And that just isn't what she is doing right up until 1483. It, she starts doing it in 1483 and I don't think anyone would deny that. But <laughs> up until that point, she's absolutely not doing that. I mean, I mean, in many ways, you have just paid Philippa Gregory a huge compliment because you've kind of put her on the level of Shakespeare. So, uh... well, so you know, these, these things are... A, a testament to the quality of what they write but it's as an historian it makes you want to bang your head against the wall um because it it gets so much deeper ingrained than a, a non-fiction book that any of us will write <laughs> what, what what william shakespeare is to richard iii philippa gregory is to margaret Beaufort. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, uh, I mean, I, I mean, if I was Philippa Gregory, I'd be well happy with that. <laughs> Maybe not as a historian, but uh, that's, that's definitely a credit to, to her work. But I mean, we are talking now about, about, about Margaret Beaufort. So I feel like it's a good chance to kind of move on a little bit with that and just ask you, Nicola, um, you know, how much then was Margaret this power behind the throne? And, and uh, Matt mentioned a minute ago about 1483 definitely kind of becoming set on trying to make her, her son king. But she does have these incredible kind of diplomatic games that she's playing throughout her throughout her kind of adult life. Um, so, yeah, yeah, how much is she is she a power behind the throne? Yeah, I mean, you're, um, Max, right. I think 1483 is really the turning point for Margaret. And I have, this is my theory, so I can't, I can't prove it, but this is, uh, this is something that I think may sound credible and the guys may or may not agree. Um, but now, Margaret, sure. um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very clear that prior to 1483, Margaret was working for um, to ensure her son's safety. She was negotiating with Edward the Fourth in order to bring her son home from exile because he'd um, he'd fled abroad in 1471 in the aftermath of the Battle of Tewkesbury with Jasper Tudor. And um, yeah, it's very clear that she was working to to try and negotiate terms whereby he could return home to England and. She did a pretty good job in so much that Edward IV 
drafted a pardon for Henry. It uh, still survives in the archives at Westminster Abbey. But then Edward rather inconveniently dies unexpectedly on 9th of April, 1483. And that throws uh, all of Margaret's plans and hopes for Henry's future safety into uncertainty. And what happens is that um, when Richard III establishes himself as king, <laughs> I thought you'd like that, Matt. Um, <laughs> uh, the day prior to his coronation, so on the 5th of July, we know that Margaret has a meeting with Richard, um, with her then, with her fourth husband, Thomas Stanley. And we know that part of the discussion was centred around a debt that was owed to um, Margaret's family, a long-standing debt. And I think that she, there must have been some kind of conversation there about Henry Tudor, you know, can my son come home? Is it safe for him to do so? And I think that at that meeting, um, either Richard told her something that she didn't want to hear or didn't give her any guarantee that he would be as forthcoming as Edward IV had been. Because what's clear is that in quite a short space of time after Richard becomes king, Margaret was plotting against him. And, you know, we know she was instrumental in um, the Buckingham Rebellion that went dismally wrong that October. Um, and, you know, and, and paid not with her life, but with relatively what she would have believed to have been relatively heavy consequences. But none of that served to put her off. You know, we know that she carried on plotting. So I think um, at this time, you know, she has very, very much got her son's, um, well, certainly her son returning home to England um, and possibly yeah, as a rival claimant in her mind. Now, in terms of how far we can say she is the power behind the throne. It's a really, really difficult one to answer because, again, the evidence is, is pretty sketchy. Um, we can say that she was, she was very closely connected to Henry and his court for, well, for the entirety of his reign, but particularly for the first decade of the reign. And again, this has been something that she's been quite heavily criticised for and, uh a lot of people email me asking whether it's really true that Margaret was the mother-in-law from hell. And <laughs> the evidence for that is quite important. Again, that's sort of something that's perhaps been um, dramatised a bit, but the the true contemporary evidence for that um, only comes from one source, which is a, a comment made by the Spanish ambassador in, in 1498. And actually all other evidence which you know again it's fragmentary as many sources in this period are but it does suggest that actually Margaret and Elizabeth of York got along together quite well and I'm sure you know if and no offense to mothers mother-in-laws out there mine's lovely but if your mother-in-law is around all the time in in any relationship that's bound to get on your nerves and so I'm not saying that their relationship was perfect and they were best friends every day of the week. I think they were a very normal family and that, you know, they may well, Elizabeth may well have had a couple of days where she got a bit fed up of her. Um, but I also think it's important to say that I think Margaret's desire to be at the forefront of Henry's court was perfectly understandable when you consider that um, I think it's fair to say that her son was the true love of her life. And um, she hadn't, unfortunately, been given the opportunity to spend a great deal of time with him or indeed to raise him, um, thanks to the Wars of the Roses. And so I think in many ways she was making up for lost time and just getting to know her son. Mm. Um, but as to how far we can say she was the power behind the throne, I don't think, I don't necessarily think that, I think Henry didn't do anything that he didn't want to do. You know, I think he was very much his own man. Sorry, Nathan, I'll shut up a minute. Can... <laughs> but yeah, just to say, but I do think that Henry had clearly had a great deal of respect for Margaret's abilities and for, um, uh, yeah, and he trusted her. Because, and we can see this later on when she moved um, to the Midlands and Henry basically appointed her his unofficial 
lieutenant in the Midlands and in the north. So, um, well, yeah, sort of authority stretching into the north. So, yeah, I think... Fantastic. So, Nathan, I, I felt like you were, were chomping at the bit there to, to yeah. add to, to something Nicola was saying. I think it does a great disservice to ha to a man and a king like Henry VII to question whether his mother was the true power behind the throne. I mean, I think Henry VII was propelled to power by Yorkist dissidents who believed that they could meld Henry into their man. You know, he was just some random earl who had lived and grown up in exile uh, in Brittany and France. Nobody in England knew him. He had no power base. He had no money. And I think the Yorkist rebels who supported him thought that they could send him to England and they would be able to control him. They didn't know who they were dealing with. I mean, if there's few kings in England who knew their own mind as much as Henry VII... The idea that Margaret Beaufort, however deferential Henry may have been to his mother, would have been submissive to his mother in terms of policy and politics, I think the evidence is it doesn't exist for that. Um, I, I hadn't really considered the idea before that Margaret was close for the first decade because she quite simply didn't know her son. I think that's very plausible, uh, definitely. But she's just absent, really, when it comes to the actual politics of the Tudor reign. Uh, she's there for the, for the ceremonial matters. She's there for the coronation. She's there for the birth. Um, I hate to say it, she was fulfilling the, the female role of the time. She wasn't sitting in on council meetings. She wasn't part of, you know, passing judgment on people. She was just playing the role expected from somebody who was the king's mother. Um, the fact that she then spent the second part of the decade when Henry was really starting to get comfortable on the, on, the, on the throne, the fact that she spent that period away from court at places like Walk-In um, and, and her other estates, again, suggests she wasn't there for the day-to-day -day running of the Tudor regime. When it comes to the, when it comes to the mother-in-law aspect of it, again, the evidence we have between Elizabeth and Elizabeth of York, the Queen, and her mother-in-law, Margaret Beaufort, is that they work together as a team. There's a, there's a famous incident in um, 1503, no, sorry, 1497, where Henry VII wants to send his daughter away to be married to the Scottish king. She was only, I think, 13 years old at the time. Mother-in-law and daughter-in-law came together, united, to battle against Henry VII and say, this is not going to happen. You know, they worked as a team. Uh, certainly there was this one passing comment by a Spanish ambassador that Elizabeth resented Margaret Beaufort being around. Elizabeth was pregnant at the time. Uh, I'm sure, again, Nick Lee already touched on this, perhaps there are times when ladies are pregnant and they are just having a tough time. And when you've got Margaret Beaufort around all the time, perhaps, you know, fussing around her, maybe the odd comment that particular day has been recorded in posterity forever by a Spanish ambassador when a 24-year reign and Margaret knew Elizabeth as a child, there's no other evidence of this so-called bitter relationship. Again, we have a lot to owe to fiction. Uh, Matt, I can see you, you're you kind of desperate there to jump in, so uh, let's hear it. Only because I feel like as a Yorkist and a Ricardian, I need to say something horrible about Margaret Beaufort. Um, <laughs> well, we are kind of waiting for it. <laughs> I know, yeah. The difficulty is, I, I find it difficult to say anything horrible about Margaret Beaufort. The thing I always say about Margaret Beaufort is, particularly as a Ricardian, I find it difficult to like her, but I find it impossible to respect her. Um, and I think you have to look at she took this this kind of really long game picture of trying to get her, her son back into the country for 12 years, effectively, from 1471 to 1483, culminating in this agreement with Edward IV. So she's right on the cusp of getting what she's been trying to do for a decade. And then that's ripped away from her. Um, the, the accession of Edward V is always likely to mean her son won't come back because no one is going to allow a, a potential rebel or threat back into the country during a minority of a child. And however brief that is, then Richard III comes to the throne. And obviously, as Nicola said, there is this meeting. It's impossible to think they didn't discuss the plans for Henry coming home. And Richard must have said, 
no, it's not happening for whatever reason. And I think at that point, Margaret kind of snaps, probably understandable after 12 years, and she thinks, well, that's it. And I think it's important to consider as well during that period that whenever there is this exchange of power in England, there is always a rebellion close behind it and a threat close behind it. And Margaret probably recognises that and sees all of this turmoil in the spring of 1483 as her opportunity to, to grab what she wants. She's tried to negotiate what she wants and she's not got it. And this is her chance to, to proactively go after it. And in terms of her relationship with Henry then, I think from, you know, again, I'm a Yorkist, I'm not a Tudor historian, but the way that I see it is very much that you know, Margaret and, and Henry are only 13 years different in age. They've been driven apart and Margaret has spent the best part of Henry's life trying to get him close to her. So they make up for that time. And I think there's probably a big dollop of hindsight thrown into this personal closeness that I think develops between them in that their mother and son who have been pulled apart and want to spend time together and get to know each other. And that people tend to want to read into that some political power or authority or influence, particularly malign influence on Margaret's part that just isn't there. I think it's, it's reading hindsight back into a, a very difficult personal relationship that they were trying to mend and bring back together. So I, like I, said, I kind um, of feel obliged to say something horrible about Margaret, but I struggle. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's really interesting what you say about the, the human relationship that's going on here. And actually, we try and impose kind of bigger political games at play when actually these two these two individuals are, are humans. They have a relationship uh, and obviously they have been pulled apart. So they spend that time together and, and like exploring that relationship in many ways. Um, in talking about kind of the, the powers behind the throne and what and what's at play, I want to turn to you, Mike, uh, and, and just ask a little bit about um, how much the events in England during the kind of the, the period of the Wars of the Roses were actually being influenced by more of a European picture, uh, more of what was going on, for example, in France, uh, and obviously the, the, the relationship between the French and the English coming out of the Hundred Years' War. Um, one of the things we, we tend to forget is that France was going through an identical situation at the same time as the princes in the Tower of England. Um, there was a potentially huge civil war um, rising in France. Um, Madame, the, um, the regent of France, I suppose, who had been taught by her father, um, was very good at the political games that everybody else was playing. You've also got Burgundy um, fighting against the French. Uh, you've also got the Bretons and, and Brittany fighting against the French at the same time. So it's part of this huger, bigger picture that's taking place all around at this time. So we, we tend to focus more on uh, England being unstable, but the whole of Europe was unstable at that time. And there were so many things going on. And when you look at uh, Henry Tudor, um, he's not looked on badly, but he's not looked on goodly. And he doesn't play a major part in anything. Not until much later on when it becomes expedient for the French. Um, because it's well known that Richard is going to invade France again with his allies in the rest of Europe. So I think that is a, a, a massive game changer. Uh, when when you look at all the different sides fight together. And does that that, that links in uh, heavily with when um, Henry manages to, to escape from Brittany into France? Uh, yes, and, and initially um, the French are not really interested because he, he comes before um, when he comes over for Buckingham's Rebellion and um, he has to flee. Uh, and he's blown off course and he lands in France. The French are not in the slightest bit interested at that time. They just give him passage back to back to Brittany again. Uh, it's only when he flees the second time that they start to pay some some interest. Um, but as uh, as one of the uh, European chroniclers says, um, they're not doing it so much um, it, for Henry's benefit. They're doing it much more to annoy Richard. Um, which which is part of this, again, this European game that's going on at the same time. 
Okay, so I feel like uh, we, we've talked a lot about Richard and, and, and it probably feels like a good time to, to move on to him and a little bit more of the, the kind of some of the controversial questions surrounding him. Um, I'd like to, to really open this one up to start with, with, with Matt and Nathan, because you guys have a, a great history of, of, of um, debating each other on, the, on, this, on this particular question. But in, in his short reign, was Richard III a, a good king? And would he have continued in in that in that way um, had he not been uh, deposed and 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 killed at the Battle of uh, Bosworth Field? Um, Who would like to start us off on this one? I'll go in hard with a big yes and a yes. Um, although you know, I think I, I'm I'm a Ricardian, card carrying Ricardian, um, but I think you you always have to concede that Richard, in the end, was a failure as a king. He lost his life and he lost his crown. He lost his dynasty. Um, so in the big picture, uh, he failed as a king. But one of the things I tried to examine in, in my biography of him is really, can we see Richard's political policies, what he would have enacted if he'd been able to stay on the throne? And I think you can trace a lot of his interests back to his time in the north as Duke of Gloucester. And they're, they're threads that continue all the way through to his kingship. So quite often, some of Richard's policies as king are seen as desperate bids for, for acceptance and power and to keep himself on the throne. He's just trying to please the people that can keep him there. But if you actually look at the vast majority of his policies, they upset the very people that can keep him on the throne. They alienate those people. And they're the people who end up seeping away to Henry Tudor's faux court in, in exile and end up coming back to bite Richard at, at Bosworth. And I think that's because he probably had what we would have recognised as, as kind of almost socially progressive policies. I think he was interested in equity. We see him championing the common man, and he does this throughout his time as Duke of Gloucester. There are several legal cases in which Richard backs the those lower down the social scale against their social superiors, and he kind of defies the norms of um, livery and maintenance, so this system of noblemen recruiting almost like private armies of thugs by supporting them legally and allowing them to get away with whatever they want to get away with. Richard defies this regularly. And so he becomes king. Those policies are kind of seen as a threat to the status quo. So everybody who has an interest in the status quo, which is everybody with money and power and authority, sees Richard as a little bit of a threat and something to be worried about. I think he unnerves them. And I think that's why he struggles to, um, to keep hold of everybody's loyalty, which ultimately means that he fails. But I would argue that he fails for trying to do a good thing or the right thing, but not delivering it properly. I'm sure lots of people would disagree with that, but. <laughs> I think Nathan just raised his eyebrows at that one. So I think uh, I'll hand over to you. <laughs> I think when Richard came to the throne and Richard hosted his first parliament, I will concede that the acts that he passed, uh, the laws that he oversaw were commendable. You know, we're, we're recording this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're yeah. Yeah. That's my new ringtone. <laughs> there, there's, there's certainly enough evidence, which Matt is, you know, the foremost authority on that, and I'm happy to defer to his his work on that. That it is, it is, it does appear that Richard wanted good things for the country. You know, he he wasn't a monster. We know this. We know he wasn't a tyrant. I think his intentions were honourable. I would say the same. For Henry the Seventh, I think when Henry the Seventh came to the throne, his intentions at the outset of the reign were genuine. He sought to be the unifier of the realm. What I would counter again, this is ultimately what if territory. I mean, Richard simply didn't have the time on the throne for us to build up um, a picture either way of how he would have reigned. I would counter with the fact that Richard had come to the throne in controversial circumstances. Um, he had to make his first parliament a good one. Now, I appreciate what Matt is saying, that some of the acts that he oversaw were, um, you know, they were distasteful to some of the nobility and that may have ultimately played a part in his downfall. However, if he was seeking to overturn public um, opinion of him as a person, you know, rumours were rife that Richard III had killed the princes in the tower this isn't a Tudor creation later down the line. You know, there were certainly enough people who must have believed that for such conspiracy to take hold against Richard. He needed to get the people on his side. And that may have played a part in him having um, 
you know, such an honourable first parliament. Now, the second thing I would look at whether we consider Richard III to have, have the potential to be a good king is that I think history shows that most kings come to power um, and they seek to do good. I mean, it's part of the cor coronation oath. Henry VIII, you know, the most famous tyrant in English history, he came to the throne in 1509 seeking to do good. You know, he had good intentions. Henry the Seventh, and so on. Any king who reigned over England for a considerable amount of time ultimately ended their reign um, quite unfavorably. I mean, the best thing for his legacy that Henry V did was die in 1422, because there were already murmurings against Henry V about how he was taxing the nation too much. You know, if he had reigned for another 10 years, would Henry V, the famous you know, Victor Vajinko, would he have ended his reign um, hated by his people? Edward III, you know, he reigned for exactly 50 years and he's remembered as, you know, as the flower of England. But he ended his reign quite unfavourably. I just think if, if Richard III had reigned for 24 years like Henry VII, he also ultimately would have fallen victim um, to the crime of being a king for too long and having to overtax his people, regardless of how, regardless of his intentions at the outset. Uh, unfortunately, he never he never got that far to, to have that opportunity. Um, but um, Mike, uh, obviously, you, you, uh, I believe you you sit more on the side of 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 Richard in the in, in this as well. Um, what what do you think about his behaviour, like in terms of? Uh, when he was serving under his brother on the throne and, and leading up to becoming king, what do you think that says about him and, and, and his intentions, but also about what people thought of him in that role? Um, he was intensely loyal um, to, to his brother. Um, he never showed any wavering, even with all the troubles with his other brother, George. Um, he, he was just desperate. And when he was in the North, um, I think that was a necessity um, rather than choice um, because you had some seriously powerful people up in the north uh, and you'd got the aftermath of the Towton and the like and, and after Warwick. Warwick controlled huge amounts of land and they needed somebody who was powerful, part of the king's personal friends and, and associates who could rule in the north but at the same time, uh, as Matt has already said, it then alienates the people further south. Um, but as far as his relationship with his brother, I think it was very good, very solid. He supported him in any way possible, even from quite a young age, which is also quite quite a key thing um, when you compare to, to some of the others, for example. But I think Richard, as soon as he came on the throne, uh, he was very much suffering. Um, he'd got the problems with Scotland. He'd got the problems with France. He'd got the internal problems. He was facing opponents on way too many fronts all at one go. And I think he was, I suppose, struggling um, in a lot of ways to be able to perhaps be the king he wanted to be. He's trying to do those sorts of things, but all the time he's facing ad adversaries uh, from all directions, which I think sort of hampered his abilities to do things. So coming on to obviously one of the mo one of the more controversial moments of, of, of his character and his name. Um, so what do Nicola, I'll open this one to you. So, so the prince is in the tower. Uh, obviously, this is something we hear a lot about when it comes to, to Richard III. Uh, what do you believe happened to them and, and why, more importantly, as well? Um, <laughs> in simple terms, I think Richard killed them. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I can see Matt's face there. I think, I, I think what's important to say is that although I am not a Ricardian, I do agree that Richard had many excellent qualities and as Mike spoke about there, his loyalty to Edward IV, I think was extremely admirable. And neither do I think that he he was he he set out 
uh, you know, with with intentions of, of snatching the throne in the moment that Edward IV died. I think he was very much reacting to events um, as they played out. And I think, um, uh, yeah, I do think that he killed the princes because why wouldn't you? <laughs> He'd be stupid not to. I think... Um, I think it's quite telling that even though he had several opportunities to to speak up, speak up and and produce them, um, whether dead or alive, actually, um, and the fact that he just he ignores them, he says absolutely nothing. Like when there are rumours circulating that that they're dead and that he's done away with them, well, if that's not true, why doesn't he just produce them? Why doesn't he just? The I feel like then. that's a, a question you're asking to Matt in many ways. So, come on, Matt. Uh, <laughs> yeah, come on, Matt. Let's let's hear the answer to that. Why not Bring produce on, the bodies? Yeah, genuinely, well, tell me the answer. So, I think the counter to that is why doesn't Rich? If Richard kills them, why doesn't he produce the bodies? Whatever's happened to them, say that somebody else murdered them. Buckingham did it. Natural, um, you know, they were ill. They died of, of plague in the tower or something like that. Because during this period, you know, we have a strong history of people displaying bodies to prove that people are dead and can't ever be a threat to them again. So by remaining quiet, Richard actually perpetuates the threat against himself. So the easy thing to have done, would, have, if, if he killed them, would have been to produce the bodies. Now, people might say he probably killed them, but it doesn't matter. The important part is that everybody knows they're dead and they can never be used as a threat against Richard again. You know, Henry VII sees the consequences of that not having happened throughout the 1490s. Um, and I think that Richard would probably have said, why should I keep producing them? You know, every time somebody accuses me of killing them, do I wheel these boys out and renew sympathy for them, alert everybody to where they are maybe? You know, what Richard wanted was for the, the thought of them to disappear. You know, if he keeps bringing them back to the front of everybody's minds, sort of on demand, um, then that would make him look incredibly weak um, but and, and, and you know, and Nicholas said, "Why wouldn't you kill the princes? It's the obvious thing to do." I'd argue the opposite. I mean, if you look at the history at the start of that century when Henry the Fourth takes the throne, um, Richard the Second's heir presumptive is is a Mortimer, uh, Edmund Mortimer, who is a young boy, and he has a young brother called Roger. Um, and so these two boys are taken into royal custody, and they're looked after. And ultimately, when Henry V comes to the throne in 1413. They are released, given their freedom. Edmund is Earl of March, serves the House of Lancaster till 1425. And there isn't an issue. You know, people do try and pursue Edmund's claim to the throne on his behalf, but he never seems to want part of that. The House so, of York um, in particular. I just, I just noticed that a moment ago, Mike wanted to kind of inter, interject with a little something there. Um, yeah, um, basically, I'm agreeing with what, what Matt says. And particularly as well, is that knowing what had happened before, um, if you produce a figurehead, as had happened on so many occasions, even if that figurehead doesn't want to take part, um, he's still a figurehead and can still be put to the front as a, as a rallying point for whatever cause that people had got, got at the time. Um, and technically, he still could have been involved in it as well. So I just I just think that Richard could have believed that he had the opportunity to spend some time bringing those boys into his fold in the same way that Henry the Fourth had done with the Mortimer boys, and I don't understand why that wouldn't have been his first port of call if that had failed, and they were grown men who then showed any signs of rebellion against him, kill them as adults, much as Henry the Seventh did with Warwick. Um, but why would you slaughter two young children who haven't done anything to you for the threat that they might one day be? I don't see Richard is thirty when all of this happens, and there is nowhere in the previous decade or so of his adult life in active politics where you will ever see an example of him behaving in that way so it requires a complete change in his personality in 1483 to think that he would murder children as his first port of call hey, oh hey, do you want to speak up first uh you go first because that might be a while <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but surely everything that he does in 1483 shows showcases a complete change in his personality because up until that point, he's always been steadfastly loyal to Edward IV and his memory. Suddenly, he's kicking his son off the throne. So surely, and plus, the other thing that I would just add is that, you know, it, he, he was a man with, with 
a track record of violence as well. A track record of, yeah, come on. <laughs> he was. Where? Well, okay, there's, for starters, there are obviously, let's just say hints at his involvement in the murder of Henry VI in 1471. Even if he didn't strike the blade, so to speak, it, I, it's, it's, do you not agree that it's likely that he was present? He made a, and, and his role as constable of England, but ultimately Edward IV gave the order for Henry VI to die. So you can't blame Richard for that. No, I don't, no, 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 I agree. But I'm just, okay, so how would you come back from the comment that I made then about um, the fact that his behaviour does change? I'm not trying to say that, I'm not trying, like I said, I think that he was backed into a corner and was reacting very much to events rather than, oh, great, my brother's dead, I'm going to take over. I don't think that that's the case, but surely that's showing a different um surely that's sort of his whole personality um, moves away from what we know of him from that point. It Mike, depends. Um, and, sorry. Sorry, it might look like he wanted to just cut in there. So um, Yeah. Um, if, he'd, if, if Richard had really wanted to do something, he had the prime opportunity where he met um, the, the, the future king, because don't forget he wasn't crowned at that point, at Northampton. He had absolute total control uh, he, but he could have done something then. He'd got rid of the Woodfields, admittedly, but I still think there's other plots going on at the same time as that one. Uh, and then he does continue down to London with the coronation plans. So why would you do that if your overall intention was to actually get rid of them? You better go first, Nate. <laughs> right. Uh, obviously, as a disclaimer, I will always... In. But, um, we have no smoking gun. We have no concrete evidence who killed the princess in the tower. They might have survived for all we know, as a nod to Matt. Um, and we cannot say for certain, 100%, Richard III killed the princess in the tower. Anyone who says Richard III killed the princess in the tower and say that as a fact, they're wrong. That said, once I've added my disclaimer, I do believe Richard III killed the princess in the tower. I concur with Nicola. It's the obvious thing to do. I know Matt and Mike disagree with that. Um, but rather than just rehashing the entire Prince in the Tower mystery, let me just address some of the points that Matt's made. So first things first, you talk about showing the bodies. Richard III, um, you know, he didn't show the bodies. Why wouldn't, he have, why wouldn't he have done that? Now, we've got to consider that Richard III lost his crown ultimately based on just a rumour that he had killed two boys. You know, it was the rumour that he'd killed the princes that ultimately galvanised the conspiracies against him that led to his death. If he had come forward and actually presented these two bodies of these children to the kingdom and went, you are two children, uh, 12 and 9, I have killed them, therefore I am now your king. Does anyone really think the country and the anger and the protest and the conspiracy against him would have been quelled at that point. If anything, by presenting these bodies, the conspiracies would have hardened and he would have probably lost his throne a lot quicker than he did. Okay, hold that thought because I think Matt just wants to come in on something you've just said there. I, I, my counter to that, I guess, is that I would argue that, I mean, Richard's not, Richard III is not going to produce the bodies and say, I've murdered them, but he has opportunities to say that other things have happened to the boys and people may think he's murdered them but the point is if he kills them and stays quiet about it and hides the bodies what has he achieved because if people still believe that they could be alive there's still a potential threat and as i said henry the 7th suffers the consequences of that throughout the 1470 uh, the 1490s sorry particularly with perkin warbeck so if richard kills the boys and remains completely silent about their fate he kind of kills them for nothing and achieves nothing because people still believed that they could have been alive in the mid 1490s but what was worse for him? People believing and him having, uh, you know, what was still ultimately minor threats to his kingship or him revealing that he'd killed two, you know, precious and much-loved children and then really solidifying all opposition to him. He, I, don't, I, don't think he, I don't think he went into this period planning to become king. 
Hence why, to address Mike's point, he didn't kill or um, harm King Edward V, the young boy at Stony Stratford. Richard never planned any of this. I see it as him being backed in a corner and him making missteps along the way until he almost ends up on the throne as the only way he can possibly fend off these attacks against him, which is why I don't view Richard as being a tyrant. I don't view him as being a monster. I would have done exactly the same thing in his position. Richard had to secure his own dynasty. At this point, he had one son himself. His, his, his entire future objective for the House of York was no longer about his nephews, the two princes. It was about his own son. And that's it's for that reason, to protect his own dynasty, his own lineage, he was almost forced into killing the princes in the tower. Um, Matt, you mentioned the Mortimer boys from early in the century. You know, this was a precedent where two boys who had greater claims to the throne were not killed. The key difference between the Mortimer children and the later princes in the tower was that Edward V, the eldest of the princes in the tower, people throughout England, including Richard, had sworn oaths to uphold his right to be king. Nobody ever swore any oaths to the Mortimer boys. They were, and always were, just earls. Their claim might have been better, but they were never upheld by the people of England and the nobility to be kings. Therefore, they were not killed. And, just to finish that point, though those Mortimer boys did not ever claim the throne of England, descendants of the Mortimer blood were the House of York and the House of York triggered the Wars of the Roses. Do we really think Richard was not a student of history? Do we really think Richard looked back to 30 years of war before him and decided, you know what, I'm going to leave these boys live? Because after all, what's the worst that could happen? Okay, well, let, let's just take that then and, and move this on further. So I, I feel like there is a suggestion here that obviously uh, Richard did kill the boys in the tower. However, there is no evidence to suggest they were even murdered. So just to explore this a little bit further, I know both Mike and Matt have opinions on this. The likes of the pretenders uh, moving on after this, the likes of Lambert Simnel and, and Perkin Warbeck, let's just bring the conversation onto them a little bit here. Uh, and whether we believe that they are actually, in fact, who they say they were at the time, or whether they were just pretenders and, and puppets used in a game of in a game of thrones in in many ways uh matt or mike would either of you like to start us off on this one yeah sure well, well given that i've written a book called the survivor of the princes in the tower th this is where i'm gonna i'm gonna speak up on this um and i'm out of punching distance from nathan so feeling pretty safe to talk about this but um in essence if i'm pressed now on the fate of the princes in the tower and and if i don't think that richard killed them what happened to them my answer is that um, the Lambert Simnel affair in 1487 was an uprising in favour of Edward V rather than Edward Earl of Warwick. Uh, and I think there is there's scanty evidence about anything to do with the Lambert Simnel affair, but I think there is scanty evidence that people believed this was an uprising in favour of Edward V, that the way people behaved suggests that it had more to do with Edward V than the Earl of Warwick. Um, which may mean that Edward V is killed at the Battle of Stoke Field or manages to flee onto the continent. There's Adrian de Brute's chronicle tells us that Edmund de la Pole, uh, the younger brother of the Earl of Lincoln, oh. um, and I think that Perkin Warbeck was quite likely to have been the genuine Richard, Duke of York, um, and I think there, there are elements, again, of his story and his career um, the evidence, again, is scanty and difficult and challenging, and there are elements of both sides of the story, whether he is or isn't who he claims to be, that don't add up properly. Um, but if I'm pushed now, I think Lambert was Edward V and uh, Perkin Warbeck was Richard, Duke of York. Can I just ask uh, for anybody watching, uh, and even myself, who, who aren't quite sure w why they come as different names? Why are they called Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simmel when they're clearly claiming to be that when you claim them to be Edward V and, and Richard uh, of York? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that this is the way the Tudor government deal with these threats that they give them, you know, personalities as imposters. 
Uh, Lambert Simnel is supposedly a, a boy from Oxford who is plucked up, taken to Ireland and trained to impersonate Edward Earl of Warwick, is then captured on the battlefield and put to work in the royal kitchens. Um, and Perkin Warbeck, again, his story emerges um, and eventually when he's captured, his confession is that he is a boy called Perkin Warbeck or Periquin Warbeck or various different spellings of those kind of names who uh, is from a family from Tournai, um, a, you know, a fairly well-to-do family in, in Tournai on the, in the, the Burgundian kind of French border area. Um, and so those are the names that go down in history as, as effectively imposters um, so that these people weren't ever who they claimed to be. And I think that that's just the way the Tudor government machinery worked to deal with those threats, to kind of write them off and almost make a little bit of a joke out of them, that these are just, you know, boys being plucked from nowhere, pretending to be princes in a, a desperate bid to, to kick Henry off the throne. M Mike, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with everything Matt said there. Um, and I think the evidence does suggest uh, the only person who ever calls Perkin Warbeck, Perkin Warbeck, of course, is Henry VII. The rest of Europe and everywhere else, he's, he's known as Prince Richard. Um, or variations on the theme. Uh, and I always take it back to, to absolute basics on this one. Um, if he was, if he wasn't who he said he was, he could have a go once, he could have a go twice. But the person who is portrayed as Perkin Warbeck invades the country five times. You don't do that unless you're really serious or completely off your rocker. And he wouldn't be off his rocker with foreign support. So I think even in, in its simplest terms, I, I think Perkin Warbeck, as Matt said, uh, was Richard. Nathan, Nicola, I think that's over to you. What, what are, Do you have any counter arguments to say about that? I mean, this is obviously a very convoluted and complex um, topic. I mean, hence why I've written an entire book on the actual subject. Perkin Warbeck, for me... He's not Prince Richard. Um, the key to the entire conspiracies that are being led against Henry the Seventh are all they always come back to the Earl of Warwick. The Earl of Warwick, who was imprisoned in the Tower during the reign of Henry the Seventh, had clear, legitimate Yorkist blood. Uh, he had a far greater claim to the throne than uh, Henry the Seventh. I always see Warwick as being the real target behind these conspiracies. Now, in um, 1488, there was a man in France at that time called John Taylor. John Taylor was a figure who was closely aligned with the household of Warwick's father, George, the Duke of Clarence. He was a figure who then worked under Richard III. When Henry VII became king, John Taylor lost all of his positions and fled abroad to France. France at this period then entered into a war with England. John Taylor is recorded as sending a letter back to England saying, just to paraphrase, uh, watch out for next year, somebody's coming. And then who should turn up in Ireland one year later with John Taylor? Perkin Warbeck. At first, they claimed he was a son of Richard III. Then they claimed he was an illegitimate son of Edward IV. Um, before they finally settled on the fact that he was one of the princes in the tower, Prince Richard. Throughout his entire nearly decade-long campaign, Perkin Warbeck received next to no support in England. He only received support from countries who were then in a state of war with England. When they reached peace with England, they dropped Perkin Warbeck like a bad habit. They sent him on his way. Um, he attempted three invasions of England and didn't get any support. And ultimately, he, you know, he, he led what was a bit of a suicide raid in Cornwall in 1497 and was captured. Now, we can argue that Hergen Warbeck confessed to Henry VII in 1497 and revealed himself to be Hergen Warbeck of Tonnay. For several years before this date, before he was captured, the rumours were rife on the continent that he was not Prince Richard. The French had revealed to Henry 
after they um, they negotiated a peace with Henry, they revealed that they knew him to be a fraud. And why wouldn't they? If Perkin Warbeck was a French-born, French-speaking citizen born in Tournai, who had surfaced during the period France were at war with England, I think they might have known a bit about this conspiracy. They revealed to Henry Warbeck was a fraud. The Spanish investigated a group of Portuguese merchants before Warbeck was captured, and they revealed his background. They revealed him to be a son of John Osbeck of Tournai. You know, this name wasn't created by the Tudor administration. This name was known. There's an abundance of evidence that exists in the Tournai records which show who the Warbeck family were. Everything that Warbeck confessed to in 1497 can be corroborated. Um, I think it's very... I think his story is also very convenient. If we look at what Warbeck claimed when he was doing his campaign, he claimed he was one of the princes of the tower. His elder brother happened to be murdered. When it came to his turn, his assassin took pity on him and just let him slide on out of the prison. I mean, if anyone knows anything about medieval politics, you're not letting the number one prisoner in the realm just slink out. You know, what was that assassin going to turn around to whoever gave him the order to kill this boy, whether it was Richard III or Henry VII, sorry, sir, I let him go. That, that wouldn't have happened. You know, Warbeck's story always was fanciful. It always was convenient. And everything he said can be corroborated in the evidence. Uh, Matt, do you want to... Uh... Yeah, just, just to try and, you know, argue a couple of points with Nathan, which is what I'm here to do. Um, on the question of Perkins' identity, I think the the stories that he first impersonated the illegitimate son of, Rich, of Richard III and then impersonated the Earl of Warwick and then finally settled on Richard Duke of York comes from official Tudor story. There is no account from inside Perkins' conspiracy that he ever used any identity other than Richard, Duke of York. So for my money, this is the Tudor government kind of obfuscating things and trying to make him look like a joke. Um, and they can say effectively whatever they want about him after he's been captured. Um, I think the story about Edward V, you know, Richard, Duke of York, whatever, he may not have known what happened to his brother, if he's the real Richard, Duke of York. Uh, he may not have known what happened to his brother, but in order for him to claim the throne, he has to say that his brother is dead and out of the way by by some means or another. Perhaps he died at the Battle of Stoke. Oh, Matt, I think we've lost you. Oh, just just repeat your, that last sentence. You just cut out. Sorry. Um, so uh, if if Perkin Warbeck was the, the genuine Richard Duke of York, he doesn't necessarily have to have known um, what had happened to his older brother. Uh, he could have died at the Battle of Stoke Field, and they perhaps didn't want to admit that they'd already attempted a failed Yorkist invasion of England. But Perkin, if he's the real Richard Duke of York, has to be clear that Edward V is out of the way and he's now the rightful claimant to the throne one way or another. So perhaps he comes up with this fanciful story that his brother was killed and, and he was spared. Um, and I think the, uh, the argument about the support on the continent in particular um, being convenient, um, that people do it to make trouble for Henry, and then as soon as they sign a treaty, they abandon Perkin. is absolutely fair, but it works both ways. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Perkin isn't the genuine Richard Duke of York, that they use this figure to create trouble for Henry, get the terms that they want in peace treaties and things like that, and then are happy to abandon him because they don't really care whether Henry VII or Richard Duke of York is on the throne. The fact that, that those kind of power politics are going on doesn't necessarily mean that Perkin couldn't have been the genuine Richard Duke of York. I think one point as well that must always be considered when we're looking at whether Warbeck was the genuine article is that on the 23rd of November, 1499, he was hanged as a commoner at Tyburn. Just before he was hanged, the uh, London Chronicle reports that for the last time he admitted that he was an imposter and that he was not a son of Edward IV. I find it very difficult to believe somebody of that period with, um, you know, with the fear of God that the people of the 15th century had would lie just before he's due to be hanged. Warbeck confessed once more he was a fraud. And I think for me, that is the most telling aspect of this entire period. 
and I, I think my comeback for that, and you know, we can we could have this ding dong all night, couldn't we, Nathan? We frequently do. Um, I guess my comeback from that is that something else that you and I disagree about the potential of is is Perkin having had children with his wife Catherine Gordon. Is he doing this to protect his wife and his children? Has he been promised that they'll be well treated and looked after if he plays along with this game? And so that's the final way that he can and try and look after his wife and children you know we don't know for definite that they had children we don't know that those threats were leveled against him absolutely but that's a possible explanation for why Perkin would voluntarily give his confession again you know uh, on the gallows uh, it's 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 fantastic to hear everybody uh, go at it with their with their opinions I'm, I'm very well aware of the time and we have about 10 minutes left so what I want to do is I've taken notes of a few of the questions people have been asking at home and I'd just like to throw them out to you all uh, throw a few of them out to you all before before we wrap it up for the evening um one one of the one of the questions is is historical fiction in terms of historical fiction is there any historical fiction that you guys uh would recommend um uh, that is obviously very in keeping with what you believe to be to be the truth as well i would heartily recommend my two novels <laughs> and loyalty and honor <laughs> on richard the third um and then just afterwards so yeah i'll get i'll get an you know, cheeky plug in there for my books. Um, I would always say that, you know, historical fiction is a great gateway to the history, but it, it never is the history. Um, if it encourages people to pick up a non-fiction book because they've found something or somebody that they're interested in and they investigate it further, that's fantastic. But I think the danger is ever stopping your learning at historical fiction because it, it is a story. It isn't the truth. It isn't the, the facts. Um, you kind of need to double check those in a, a non-fiction book about the subject that you, you find yourself interested in. Enjoy them, but don't take them as, as non-fiction history. Nicola, do you have any recommendations? Yeah, I do. I'll just say I couldn't agree more with what Matt's just said. I think that's that's really key. It's so frustrating when people sort of say to you, you know, they just they reel off something that they've read in historical fiction and and take that as gospel truth and it's not um, but yes I think I don't think it's quite out yet but I just before Christmas I was reading um Alison Weir's novel um it was it's the last in her six queen series about six wives of Henry VIII and it's it's the last novel about Catherine Parr and it's absolutely stunning and sort of based on well it is it's based on um historical lots of historical research and um, and I think offers some really interesting new insights into Catherine Parr. Nathan? Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with both of what you said about the, you know, the credibility almost of historical fiction. Um, moving on from that, I don't really get to read much anymore because I'm too busy writing my own books and being stuck in dry, you know, records. But I... A couple of years ago, I did read the work of Joanna Hickson, who writes a lot on the early Tudors. Um, I think one of her books was called First of the Tudors, about Jasper Tudor and Henry Tudor. Um, obviously, it's fiction. You know, there's an element of inventing conversations and so on. But she actually, she doesn't stray too far at all from the known historical record. And she's picked the perfect period in Henry's exile to Brittany. Um and follows that and yeah I would, I would definitely give a shout out to the work of Joanna Hickson. Fantastic and Mike lastly? Um, I totally agree what everybody said I teach medieval history as you know and I spend so much of my time in teaching medieval history of people saying but so and so said that in, in their book and you then have to spend an inordinate amount of time unpicking the arguments in, in novels I have to read novels so I know what's going to be thrown at me as a potential question while I'm while I'm teaching. Um, one of my favourites of a novel is uh, The Sun in Splendour, of course, um, and I would recommend that. But even even that, you still got to remember it's a novel. Who 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 wrote that, Mike? The Sun in Splendour. That is uh, God. It's gone out of my head. Sharon K. Penman, who Thank you very passed much. away fairly recently. Yes. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but just for anybody who obviously wants to take notes and, and look out for it, it's good to know the uh, the name of the writer. Okay, awesome. So another question a question we have is, uh, did anyone specifically accuse Richard of murdering the princes in the tower in his lifetime? 
um, either a political player, a, a, a king, um, a, anyone. Lots of the rumours are muddy, but I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, the, the certainty that Richard murdered the princes in the tower really originates on the continent, particularly in France, though. Um, and as Mike alluded to earlier, France has lots of its own internal problems going on at this time and sees Richard very much as a threat. So they have kind of reason to, to malign him. So lots of these people are, are heading out of England or to the continent. Do we have um, any names? Stories. Guillaume de Rochefort is the the probably the most famous one. So in January 1484... So within a year of Richard taking the throne, he gives a speech to the French Parliament talking about how um, over in England, the, the brother of the king has murdered the rightful heirs and taken the throne for himself. Um, but, you know, where is Guillaume de Rochefort getting his information from? It's not well known in England. So how is it well known in France? Um, and I think France has its own political agenda going on, which means we can't say that what they're saying isn't true but they definitely have reasons to be saying those things about Richard. They perceive him very much as a threat. He was on the verge of invading France. And so they have reasons to want to say he's a, a, a naughty, nasty, evil tyrant who kills children. And they're, you know, they're going through, as Mike said before, they're going through their own minority crisis at the time. So they want to say, look what happens if you don't protect the child who's on the throne. You get this horrible monster who murders him and steals his throne instead. And, you know, we don't want to be like those horrible English, do we? They're a terrible bunch over there. Um, so I think, we have to take everything that we read with a pinch of salt. And so everything positive about the period about Richard, we have to take with a pinch of salt because the sources are so difficult, so conflicting, so scanty, and so laden with agenda and meaning. It's it's always a subjective issue to look at the events of 1483. It's always going to come down to, you know, Nathan and I will frequently read the exact same piece of evidence and I'll say, oh, well, that proves Richard III was innocent. And Nathan will say, no, that proves he's guilty because you can read the same thing and interpret it completely different ways. It's so wide open. That's what makes it so difficult, but so endlessly fascinating. I think there, there's another important. question here, um, Nathan. I think I can I can probably target this one at, at you and Nicola here. There's another one which says, why did Yorkist nobles support pretenders if they knew that the princes were dead or believed that the princes were dead? Uh, the Stanleys, for example. Sorry, the question up. Why did Yorkists support the pretenders? Yeah, why did Yorkist nobles support pretend support the pretenders if they knew or believed that the princes were dead? And they used the Stanleys for an example. Well, I mean, quite frankly, if if we take what we understand as Yorkist nobles to be Edward the Fourth nobility who supported Henry the Seventh, they didn't support the pretenders. You know, the vast majority of the nobles under Henry the Seventh stayed loyal. The city of York, which so famously um, was crushed at the death of Richard III in 1485, you know, that stayed loyal to Henry throughout his reign. Um, the majority of the nobles stayed loyal. The one noble who did defect from Henry's side, early doors, was John de la Poole, the Earl of Lincoln. Uh, the Earl of Lincoln was Richard III's nephew. Um, many people believe that he was potentially in line to the throne himself. I believe that he defected to the to the pretender Lambert Simnel because he had he either had um ambitions to place the real Warwick on the throne, who was in the Tower of London and was not Lambert Simnel, or he had ambitions for the throne himself. Now, you know, again the, the counter argument to that, just to weigh in with what Matt would say, was that Perhaps Dillapool Lincoln did actually defect to the pretender because he believed that Lambert Simnel was truly a Yorkist prince. So let's let, let's just assume that was the case. So that's one Yorkist noble who's defected. Where are the rest? Nobody else defected high up in the in the Yorkist command. Now William Stanley did in 1495 seemingly defect um, or have plans to defect to Perkin Warbeck. It was something that he was hanged for. But if we add context as to what was going on in William Stanley's life at that time, William Stanley, perhaps above everybody else, was responsible for placing the Tudors on the English throne. History shows and is recorded that it was his brother, Thomas Stanley, who intervened at Bosworth. The sources seem to suggest it was his younger brother, William Stanley, who intervened and won the day for Henry VII. 
There's even a recording that it was William Stanley who picked up the crown, walked up to Henry on the battlefield and went, Sir, I make you king. How was William Stanley rewarded for this? Not very well. Uh, you know, he, he, he coveted the earldom of Chester. He didn't get it. Uh, his brother was made an Earl of Derby. So William Stanley became the richest commoner in England, but that's all he remained, a so commoner. A bit of a grudge. He, exactly. He was never inducted into the peerage. Now, by 1495, when he had designs to defect, I think there's just enough context there that it wasn't necessarily about who the boy was. It was more an opportunity to join a conspiracy to depose Henry VII. Because, again, I see the entire Perkin Warbeck conspiracy. And again, maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? It's just my opinion. But I see the entire Perkin Warbeck conspiracy as ultimately to put the Earl of Warwick on the, cra- on, on the throne. And I think Stanley has just seen an opportunity to see what else is out there. The cool. grass was greener for him once. Maybe the grass will be greener again. I'm just, I'm just wary of the time. I want to ask one more question, but before I do, Matt, you really wanted to come in there and just, uh, just have a little, say a little something on that. Oh, Matt, we can't hear you again. Oh, I don't know. Hello? Two the propaganda at work. This is. <laughs> We've been silenced. No, um, um, am I back? Yeah, you're back now. There you go. Sorry. Um, yeah, so with John de la Pole, you know, if he wanted to take the throne for himself, I don't understand why he wouldn't have made that bid in his own name. He's a fully grown man. Why would he have oh. having it? Have I gone again? Yeah, well, you're, you're cutting in and out. Um, try, try one more time. Um, I was just saying, if, if John de la Pole wanted the throne for himself... Um, why would he not have pursued it in his own name? Why would he hide behind a a boy from Oxford when you have a perfectly fully grown man there who everybody knows who he is, um, who could have championed his own claim? Um, And I think the thing with William Stanley is, you know, whatever his own personal situation, again, doesn't necessarily mean that Perkin Warbeck wasn't genuine um, and that he didn't at least believe that there was a possibility that one of Edward IV's sons was alive to to champion him and perhaps give him a better um, lot than Henry had given him. Um, but I would also just add that, you know, the lack of Yorkist nobility is possibly down to the fact that the Wars of the Roses had taught people that taking sides was an incredibly dangerous thing to do, that abandoning the king meant that you would lose your life, your titles, your family would lose all of their inheritance. It happened over and over again through that period. So it made people incredibly cautious and unwilling to take that step. And I think that probably worked in Henry's favour uh, and worked against the pretenders, irrespective of whether they were who they said they were or not. They just couldn't get the support because it was too dangerous to do it. Awesome. And then I think the last question that I'll ask that I've seen from the, from the audience tonight is, uh, and I think this one's uh, maybe towards you a little bit here, Nicola. Uh, it's a little bit suggestive, but I quite like it. Uh, didn't Margaret Beaufort's husband have access to the tower during the time? So I feel like there's a little bit of a suggestion there towards Margaret Beaufort maybe murdering the princes in the tower. Uh, what do you think on that? No, come on. I, it's so frustrating, this whole idea of Margaret being responsible for the murder of the princes in the tower. I'm sorry, but it's just ludicrous. And I think it's important to say that whether you believe that the princes were murdered or not, whether you believe that Richard was responsible or not, the culprit or not, as may be, was not Margaret Beaufort. I think it's very telling that there is not one shred of contemporary evidence that suggests that Margaret had any involvement whatsoever. And actually the first hint or suggestion that she had been responsible doesn't come until, I think it's the 17th century, um, long after her death anyway. And I think that that is the most compelling sign of her innocence is that, you know, nobody is linking her with the disappearance of the princes at this time. So, no, sorry, she ain't guilty. <laughs> can, can I have another hour, please, just to address? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, afraid, I'm afraid not tonight. Maybe we'll have to do a rematch <laughs> later on. Um, OK, I think we'll, we'll call it a night there. I think we've had a fantastic discussion. Um, I'm really grateful for everybody joining in and I hope that you guys at home have found it useful or have enjoyed hearing what these guys have had to say. Um, 
there is the poll uh, for you guys to to fill out and choose which house you want to you want to support, as it were. It is in the description of the of the YouTube stream, so please do go click on the poll. Let us know whether you believe it you'd fight for the House of York or the House of Lancaster. Also, when it comes to these guys, if you have enjoyed what they have to say, if you are interested in finding out more, the links to their books are in the description below. But lastly, I just want to say a big thank you to all of the all of our historians tonight. Uh, Mike Ingram, Matt Lewis, Nicola Tallis, Nathan Amon. Thank you so much for joining us. It's just honestly an incredible opportunity to have you guys all on the same platform, hearing you bounce off each other the way you have and, and hearing your, your thoughts. And as I'm sure everybody feels, we could probably go on all night with this. Um, but uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to end it there. But thank you so thank much. You, thank you, Tom, for setting all of this up. And Oh no! Thank you. Work on your part. So thank you very much. Oh, yeah, thank you, Tom. Bless you. No, it's it's my pleasure, and and I'm just so glad that we've managed to do it. And hopefully, we can do something similar like this again soon. Um, so thank you all, and uh, good night. safe.